Find in your Bibles Leviticus chapter 16 this morning, the book of Leviticus chapter 16. <clears throat> and certainly the Lord is good today. Uh, he's good today like He is every other day. And uh, if you're here this morning and you're just thankful to be saved, would you say amen? amen. Our prayer this morning, my prayer is this, uh, that if you're here today and you don't know Christ as your Savior, that today would be the day that you come into a relationship with the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Alpha and the Omega, the Great, the great One, that you would come into a relationship with Him today. And this morning as we consider and as we look into this text, uh, we're going to consider this subject, His life for mine. His life for mine. And you know, Jesus came to do many things. He came to do, and He did a lot of things when He walked this earth. He did a lot of things, a lot of good for a lot of people. He spoke a lot of truth. But the main thing that Jesus came to do was to bear and to take away our burden. <clears throat> And you know, we could poll the world about what our burden is. What is our greatest need? What is our greatest thing that we need? What is that burden uh, that Jesus could lift from us? And we might get a lot of different things. We might get uh, poverty, and we might get uh, world hunger and world peace and all of those different things. But listen, Jesus came to bear our great burden, and that great burden is our sin burden. It is our sin. It is that we are sinners by nature. And Jesus came to deal with our sin problem. And praise his name, he took our place on the cross of Calvary. He became our sacrifice, our substitute. And I'm going to tell you, if you're here this morning and you're lost, you need to be saved. Straight up. That's, I never have regretted the day that I came to Christ and made him my Savior. If you're here today and you're saved, this message is for you because, listen, we ought to celebrate our salvation. We ought to celebrate what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross of Calvary and giving us eternal life. Let's stand together as we read in this Old Testament book, Leviticus chapter 16, beginning in verse 9. Oh, verse 5, sorry. Leviticus chapter 16 and verse 5. And he shall take of the congregation of the children of Israel two kids of the goats for a sin offering, and one ram for a burnt offering. And Aaron shall offer his bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself, and make an atonement for himself and for his house. And he shall take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle, of the congregation. And Aaron shall bring the goat upon which the Lord's lot fell and offer him for a sin offering. But the goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to make an atonement with him and to let him go for a scapegoat into the wilderness. And then we go down to verse 20 of this chapter. Verse 20 says, And when he hath made an end, of reconciling the holy place and the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar, he shall bring the live goat. And Aaron shall lay both his hands upon the head of the live goat and confess over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel and all their transgressions and all their sins, putting them upon the head of the goat and shall send him away by the hand of a fit man into the wilderness. And the goat shall bear upon him all their iniquities unto a land not inhabited, and he shall let go the goat in the wilderness. Let's pray together this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your presence in this service. Lord, we thank you for your goodness, your mercy, and your grace, and we pray that you would move in, the, in our service. God, we pray that you would speak to us and uh, let your word speak to us what we stand in need of today. It's in the name of Jesus I pray. Amen. You can be seated. You know, as we consider in Leviticus chapter 16, what we find uh, is the day of atonement in Israel, the day of atonement uh, with the Jewish people. And we see in this passage of Scripture the procedures on the annual day of atonement. Uh, what you might hear this called today, they still celebrate this, uh, this event today. You might hear it called Yom Kippur. Uh, and this is the highest and the holiest day 
day on the Jewish calendar. In fact, even today and, and throughout the, the past of Israel, there's only been one day throughout Israel's history that it was, it was mandatory that you had to fast, and that was on the Day of Atonement. It was a special day. It was a holy day. In fact, it was the holiest of all days on the Jewish calendar. It, it is also known as the Great Day or just simply the day, and they know what you're talking about. You're talking about the Day of Atonement. And on that day, the high priest would enter into the Holy of Holies one time a year, and he would sprinkle the blood of a sacrifice. He would sprinkle the blood of a lamb on the mercy seat and in front and around the mercy seat. He would sprinkle that blood. And listen, he had to have one sacrifice for himself. You know why? Because even the, the, the high priest was a sinner. Even this priest, Aaron, that we find, he had sin in his life and he had to make an atonement for his sin. He had to make a sacrifice for his sin. And the other thing that we find in this passage of Scripture... He had one goat for himself. He had one uh, sacrifice for the people. And then he had another sacrifice, what is known to be as the scapegoat here in Leviticus chapter 16. And the scapegoat signified the taking away of sin, the removal of sin. And can you imagine as a kid at this day of atonement, can you imagine maybe even knowing this goat that maybe you've played with? And it, it comes time for the Day of Atonement, and they take this, and maybe this is the first time that you remember seeing this in your life, but they take this goat, and they slaughter it, and they drain all of the blood out of it, and they make this sacrifice. Can you imagine the imprint that would leave on your mind? Can you imagine how that would change you as a person as you experience this? And listen, as far as the scapegoat goes, we're familiar with scapegoats today, aren't we? What that means is this, the escaping goat. The escaping goat. Politics is full of scapegoats. Where somebody up here will do something, but somebody lower on that ladder will come up and they'll raise their hand and they'll say, well, I did that and I'm guilty. What are they doing? They are taking the, the, the repercussions of whoever else really did it, and they are becoming the scapegoat. They are taking the punishment. They are taking the repercussions on themselves, and they're letting this other one go free. And so we're familiar. Prisons are full of scapegoats, so they say. There are some scapegoats, no doubt, in prison, but, but, but there are a lot that maybe they claim to be a scapegoat. <clears throat> maybe if you had a brother or a sister. Right? Maybe your brother, your little brother did something and, and you didn't want him to get in trouble. So as a good big brother, uh, you said, well, uh, I'll take that for him. Scapegoat. The idea of a scapegoat. Listen, man didn't come up with the idea of a scapegoat. Do you realize that? That didn't originate with man. The idea of a scapegoat originated with God before this world ever came into existence. He was going to give his son to be the scapegoat for all of us, for the sin of the world. God had a plan in motion before this world was created. He had a plan before man ever came into existence, before there was ever sin in existence in the world. God had a plan for the scapegoat. And Jesus has done to perfection what this Old Testament ritual did in symbol. Now I want you to notice with me first of all in this text, notice two goats were selected. Two goats were selected. And we see that in verse 5. Notice their source, where they came from. Where did they get these goats from? In verse 5 it says, and he shall take, notice this, of the congregation of the children of Israel, two kids of the goats for a sin offering and one ram for a burnt offering. And so where did they get these goats from? Just the congregation. What I want you to understand, there was, no, there was nothing special about these, these goats that were selected. They were ordinary goats. They came out of the congregation. Uh, they looked like the other goats. Uh, they did not stand out. They were not special like some of the other sacrifices uh, had the requirements of being. And I want you to, to notice in Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 2. Okay, so they just came. They're ordinary goats. They come from the congregation. 
and they look like all the other goats. Notice what Isaiah says prophesying about Jesus Christ in Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 2. It says, For he, Jesus, shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. What does that tell us about Jesus? When he was born in Bethlehem, there was no sign on his head. He looked like every other Jewish baby. As he grew up and he became a man, uh, there was nothing special about his appearance. In fact, the Bible tells us that people from the same town, Nazareth, as Jesus, they were amazed at the fact that they were thinking Jesus is the Messiah. And they began to say stuff like this, is not this Mary's son? Don't we know his brothers? Didn't we watch this boy grow up? There's nothing special about this guy. Look at him. He is, he's an ordinary Jewish man. Uh, isn't his brothers James and isn't he the carpenter's son? Isn't his, isn't his brother Simon? But I want you to understand this. There was more to Jesus than what people could see, wasn't there? Absolutely, there was more to Jesus than what people could see. In fact, one day, Jesus stood before his enemies and he said, Who can convict or convince me of sin? He says, prove that I have committed one sin. Listen, I wouldn't do that to my family, much less my enemy. Why did Jesus do that? Because they couldn't convince him of sin. They couldn't convict him of sin. Notice not only the source of these two goats, but notice their sanctification in verse 7. In verse 7, And he shall take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. So at verse 7, they're pre presented unto the Lord. And at this point, these ordinary goats are deemed holy. They're deemed holy. Think about Jesus. Jesus was, he was pure in every way. He was the sinless Son of God. He was holy. He never committed even a little sin. He never told a little white lie. He never had a thought, a sinful thought. In fact, listen to what some writers said about him in the Bible. Peter said this about Jesus, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Paul said, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. The book of Hebrews says that he was touched in all points as we are, yet without sin. John said this about Jesus. He was manifested to take away our sin, and in him was no sin. He was the sovereign Son of God, that he might be able to be the sinless Son of God. Listen, he is not only the Son of God, but he is God the Son. He is sovereign. What does that mean? It means that he is equal. He is God. He is God, and so he's the sovereign Son of God, and that enabled him to be the sinless Son of God. Why can't I live without sin? Because I'm not God. I'm man, and I'm a sinner. And Jesus Christ, he lived, he, he, he lived a sinless life, enabling him to be the sacrificing Son of God. Making him the supernatural Son of God, he rose three days later from that grave. He is the supreme Son of God, and He sits at the right hand of the Father. And listen, I'm not done. He's the soon coming Son of God. He's coming in power. He's coming in might. The first time He came as a lamb, the second time He's not going to come that way. He's going to come as the Lion of the tribe of Judah. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And so notice their selection in verse 8. We've looked at their source of the congregation. We've looked at their sanctification. They presented them before the Lord. And then in verse 8, And Aaron shall cast lots upon the two goats. Now this is not gambling. The Lord overrode this process. I can't say that I understand everything about this, but, but it says here, He cast lots upon the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other lot for the scapegoat. And so the Lord was going to show them which, land, which goat was going to die and which goat was going to become the scapegoat. Think about the picture of Jesus here. The Lord overrode this process. Who picked the one that was going to die? God did. Who picked the one that was going to live? God did. And I'm reminded of the Old Testament story 
You remember when, when Abraham and Abraham takes Isaac because God tells him to, and they go up that mountain. And God says, I want, you to, I want you to sacrifice your son, Isaac, to me. And so they go up, the, they go up this mountain, and Isaac knows well enough what's going on. He, he knows that they're going there to worship. They're going there to sacrifice. And he says, he says Dad, I see, I see the wood and I see the fire, but where is the sacrifice that we're going to make? And you remember what Abraham told him? He says, Son, God will provide a lamb. And I don't know if I'm just too country or whatever, but I think as Abraham and Isaac are coming up one side of that mountain, God has got a, he's got a lamb coming up the other side of the mountain, and they're going to meet at the top. God will provide a lamb. That's what Abraham told Isaac. God provided this lamb in verse 8, but God provided some 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, he provided us a lamb, a lamb to take away the sin of the world. Notice the, Lord, the Lord's goat served as an atoning sacrifice. That's the one that's going to die. And his death, Jesus' death on the cross atoned for the sin of the whole world. I think that the blood of Jesus is so rich that it could save this entire world if they just come to Jesus Christ. I believe his, his blood has not lost any value. It's not lost any power. But it is still saving blood today. He made that sacrifice on the cross for the sin of the entire world. The Bible says this, he is a propitiation for our sins, not for ours only but also for the sins of the whole world. Listen, Jesus Christ died and paid the sin debt for even the lost man. Amen. Those that will spend eternity in hell, they went there with their sin paid for at the cross of Calvary. And you say, well, why did they go there then? Because they rejected the sacrifice that God made. They rejected the Savior of the world. And so God allows them to go on with that choice. Isn't that a thought, though? A person spent an eternity in hell, and their sin was paid for. Their sin was paid for. Hebrews chapter 9, we had this as our scripture reading, but verse 24. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the truth, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. He went to the mercy seat there in heaven. He, shed, he, he sprinkled his blood. He made an atonement there in heaven. And he says, not yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with blood of others. He's talking about the day of atonement here. He says, but in verse 26, For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world, but now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. What does that mean to me? That means all it took was for Jesus Christ to make the one sacrifice, and it's good forever. It's good forever. He doesn't have to make another sacrifice, and I'm telling you, it's good enough to save us forever. Notice the living goat served as a substitute as a symbol of the removal of sin. In the Bible, they ask the disciples one time, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They answered, Believe on the Lord. Believe on the Lord. By His stripes we are healed. We must believe. And what I understand is this. It should have been me on the cross of Calvary. But he stood in my place. Now, secondly, notice this. One goat sacrificed. And so two goats are selected. One of them's going to live. The other one's going to die. Notice one goat is sacrificed. In verse 9, it says, And Aaron shall bring the goat upon which the Lord's lot fell and offer him for a sin offering. That sounds really simple, but I don't think it's that quite that simple as it, as it is in verse 9. Think about the pain of sacrifice. And as they would take that goat and as they would sacrifice, as the Bible says, that goat, they would put it to death. And all of the blood of that goat was shed on the altar. It was kind of a brutal process. But I want to tell you this, Calvary was a brutal process. Calvary was a brutal process. The altar was upright, but the results were the same. Death are the results. 
Think about the physical pain of Calvary, the cat of nine tails ripping flesh, the crown of thorns, and the pressure that must have caused. Jesus felt it all. The Bible says that physically he was beaten unrecognizable, that nails put him and hung him on the tree. Think about the nails as they are driven into the hands and the feet and the sensation that that must have sent all throughout the nerves of his arms and his legs. Can you imagine as the nails were, were driven into the hands and the feet of Jesus? Someone once said, nails hung him on the cross, but love kept him there. A brutal process, the pain of sacrifice. What is this pointing to? This is pointing to Jesus Christ. Think about the emotional pain. He's crucified with sinners. They come by and they mock Jesus and they wag their heads and they say things like, if you are the Son of God, why don't you, why don't you save yourself and everyone else? Spiritually, he endured pain. The sinless one is all alone. He grew the tree that he finds himself on. He grew the tree. He knew what would happen. Think about the purpose of sacrifice. It is to atone for sin. The Bible teaches us this principle that it takes blood to deal with sin. Think about Romans chapter 6 and verse 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The Bible says without the shedding of blood there is no remission for sins. We sing these songs, what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make us whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilty stains. It takes blood to deal with our sin problem. And the priest would go and would sprinkle the blood on that mercy seat. You see, that it wasn't enough that the goat died. The, the blood must be applied on the mercy seat. The atonement had to be made. It wasn't enough that Jesus Christ died on the cross. His blood had to be applied. And if you're here and you're lost this morning, listen, you, you may know that Jesus died, but His blood's never been applied to your heart and to your life until you accept Him as your Savior. Until you repent of your sin and you put your faith and your trust in Him, it must be applied. And I want to be very plain, and I try to be plain always about this. There aren't many ways to heaven. There's only one. He is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by Him. A sanitized gospel will not save anybody. People say, oh, well, we don't need the blood and that kind of stuff today. Oh, yes. <laughs> it's essential for the removal of sin, for the remission of sin. Notice the picture of sacrifice. Every goat killed in the Old Testament pointed to Jesus Christ coming and dying on the cross and making the atonement for our sin. Let me ask you, have you received the gift of God? Have you received salvation this morning? Have you put your faith and your trust in Him? Have you called on Him to save you? Because He alone is our salvation. Being a Catholic won't save you. I'm going to say it again for those in the back. Being a Catholic won't save you. Listen to me. Being a Pentecost had never saved anybody. Being a Presbyterian won't save. Being a Methodist won't save. Even being a good old Baptist won't save you. Only the blood of Jesus saves. Only the blood of Jesus can deal with our sin. Being a church of Christ is not enough. Being a good old boy is not enough. You know any good old boys? They're not going to heaven without Jesus as their Savior. Being a religionist won't save us. Only Jesus Christ will save. And so one goat is sacrificed. And then thirdly, I want you to notice this. One goat is sent away. One goat is sent away. And notice the picture here, the transferring of sin. Notice in verse 21 of, of uh, Leviticus chapter 16. Verse 21, And Aaron shall lay both his hands upon the head of the live goat, and confess over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel, and all their transgressions and all their sins, putting them upon the head of the goat, and shall send him away by the hand of a fit man into the wilderness. 
You see, here's the second. What, what the first goat picture? Or who did the first goat picture? Jesus. Now, the second goat is going to also picture Jesus. And you say, why? Because it takes a lot of different things to, to really tell what Christ did for us on the cross of Calvary. But notice man's biggest problem is the sin problem. And notice this priest, he would take, he would lay both his hands on the head of this goat. And it says that he would confess over him all the iniquities. That means our bent or our crookedness. And what, what we all need to understand today is that we're all guilty before a holy and a righteous God. The entire world is guilty before God of, of sin and being sinners. Romans chapter 3 and verse 10. Listen to what the Word of God says. As, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Do you get that today? Is that pretty clear? That means you're no good, right? You say, well, preacher, come on now. No, there's none that doeth good. That's what the Bible says. And then you get down to verse 23 and he says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And so he would, he, would, he would confess the transgressions of the people, the iniquities of the people. And transgression means rebellion or step over the boundary. Give you a good picture of that. You tell a, you tell a child, here's the line. Don't cross the line. We've seen that this morning. Where, <laughs> what's the, what's the child going to do? They're going to just test that water. They're going to step over that boundary. What I want you to understand this morning, you may feel pretty good about yourself compared to me, but compared to God, we sh none of us have a right to feel good about ourselves. You know why? Because we, have, uh, we, we haven't just committed a little white sin. We have violated the holy law of God. We have violated the commandment of God. And the penalty for that is death. The penalty for that is eternal separation from Almighty God. Notice they would confess sin. That means to miss or to fall short of the mark. It means that you aim for the target, but you miss the target. We can't measure up. That's what the Bible is teaching us. And so all of this was confessed and placed, transferred on the head of this scapegoat, this living goat. And that symbolized this. In the dark hours, as Jesus hung on the cross, the sin of the entire world was placed on him. Sometime in there, the sin of the entire world was placed on Jesus. And he died in our place. He died for the murderer. He died for, uh, he, he died for, uh, for, for all sinners. He bore the wrath of God that we deserved. He bore the judgment of God that we deserved. He died for the sin of the world. And then notice sin taken away. We notice in verse 21, And shall send him away by the hand of a fit man into the wilderness. Again, I think traditionally there's a picture here in the fit man of Jesus Christ. And it says, The goat shall bear upon him all their iniquities into a land not inhabited, and he shall let go the goat in the wilderness. And so this fit man, let me tell you a few things about him and I'll be done, okay? The fit man, he was the one that carried this live goat and led this live goat into the wilderness. A few things about the fit man. A fit man had to be able to endure loneliness. I think that fits Jesus, don't you? The fit man had to be able to get the job done, and I think that speaks about Jesus Christ, our Savior. The fit man had to know, he had to be able to know his way back, and I think that fits Jesus. Listen, he paid our sin debt, but he knows his way back, and he's coming back again. But traditionally, here's what would happen, okay? Traditionally, they would set up stations, and they would provide for the fit man refreshment until there was a point where he had to go it alone. And that's what Jesus did. He went it alone when he suffered, and he bled, and he died at Calvary. 
And then as, think about all of the camp back in Israel. They're all waiting there. And they're waiting to receive the news that Jesus Christ, that, 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 that the goat has been taken into the wilderness. And listen, it's somber. I mean, it's almost like a Baptist church meeting sometimes. Out there, it's quiet. Everybody's low. You know why? Because they, they're waiting to, to hear that that sin of, on that goat has been taken to the wilderness. And tradition says this, that they would have red flags. And as these stations would get news, they would see somebody with a red flag over there. And they would lift up their red flag. And, and this next station would lift up their red flag until finally it got back to the camp. And guess what they would do? They would erupt into praise because their sin had been taken to the wilderness. Let me just tell you a little bit this morning. Woo, monies. Look here. This is all I got this morning, but I want you to understand this. Our sin has been dealt with. Our sin has been taken away. Our sin, the Bible says this about our sin, that as far as the east is from the west, that's how far the Lord removes our sin from us. I want you to notice, and I'll be done. But think about this, y'all. The Lord has taken away our sin this is symbolic. There's not the blood of bulls and goats. That could never take away sin. But Jesus has power to remove sins forever. And that's why he came. That's why he came. And we ought to erupt in praise. We ought to bow low in worship because Jesus has paid our sin debt. He has bore our burden. His life for mine. He has taken away our sin. And so this morning as we get ready, let's have a song of invitation. If you're here this morning and you're lost and you don't know Christ as your Savior, I want to invite you to come to Jesus today. I want to invite you to come by faith. Nothing else but Jesus. Claiming nothing. I don't invite you to come to the church this morning. I don't invite you to come to an ordinance today. I invite you today to come to Jesus Christ and be saved. Come to Jesus and put your faith in Him, in Jesus alone. And the Bible says He removes our sin as far as the east is from the west. Let me tell you what He'll do. He'll make us a child of, of His. He'll give us fellowship. He'll give us heaven. Have you come to Christ? Have you been born again? Because in Christ, there's now no condemnation. We are justified. Listen, we're, we're not perfect after we come to Jesus, but we are forgiven. Yes. We are forgiven. And then if you're here and you're saved already, what, what should a message like this do to us? Man, it ought to drive us to our knees. Because Jesus gave his life for mine. Our sin has been dealt with. We didn't deserve it. We can't earn it. Only Jesus Christ and his love and his grace, he paid a debt that he didn't know. We owed a debt that, we'd, that we couldn't pay, but he paid it on the cross of Calvary. That ought to drive us to praise his name this morning. Let's stand together today as we sing what number?